I'm going to go ahead with the meeting beginning ritual. Chile. 面向佛堂，参加先鞠躬，一鞠躬，再鞠躬，三鞠躬，参加各位的传师鞠躬，开班一鞠躬，请坐下。So, uh, one of the questions that was asked, uh, last time is. A uh, question directed to me, are you considered a master? Well, I don't really know uh, how people consider me. Um, you know, I have some ideas, but I'm never too sure because it's not my own mind. But I can tell you what I think. I am sure of my own thoughts. And so what I think specifically is that I personally do not consider myself a master of anything. I am a student like you. We are all learning together. <clears throat> so because of that, my number one preference uh, is for everyone to consider me not as a master, but as, a, as your fellow traveler in the journey of life. So it just so happens that because of karmic affinity, uh, you and I have this opportunity to travel together. Uh, we are now, uh, imagine that we are now walking side by side in this great journey called life. You know, we're commenting on the sites that we see, we're pointing different things out, um, we're talking about things that we uh, have awareness or knowledge of, you know, I may be able to, to say that, well, you know, I've gone through this particular stretch of the road, so I can tell you what's ahead. I can give you some advice. I can give you some pointers. Uh, but there's going to be times when I'll be relying on you so that I can, I can learn from you as well as the other way around. And that's, that's my next point here. We learn from one another. <clears throat> so uh, that's an easy question. To, to answer, let's move on. How do I attain peace of mind? It's, well, it's not easy. So people attain peace of mind in different ways. So for some, a hike out in nature will do it. Uh, for some, a meditative practice will do it. Uh, for some, it's a combination of all of the above. So it's not, it's not just reading books. Reading books will give you some ideas, some concepts, some suggestions on how to attain peace of mind. But books alone usually will not do it. Usually have to do something, have some kind of practice. When a hike out in nature is effective in helping you attain peace of mind, that is usually because the walk itself is meditative in nature. Uh, so think about the process of hiking out in nature, you are communing with nature, you are one with this nature that you've always been a part of, and you feel that oneness, especially strongly, uh, when you put yourself out there, you know, feel the sun, the breeze, watching everything, uh, you know, just being, just taking a very joyous uh, part in participation of the wonders of nature. So that, that could totally work. Now, but let me give you specific suggestions. For those who may find it difficult to attain peace of mind, even with hiking, even with meditation, I have specific suggestions. First, my observation is that, uh, yes, it is indeed not that easy. It's it can be considered difficult because if it were truly easy, then everyone would already be enlightened. And if you look around you, look at the people around you, look at the people that you deal with on a daily basis, is everyone enlightened? I'm sure the answer is, well, okay, not quite. Uh, driving around on the road, seeing people in a fit of road rage, that alone is enough to convince you that indeed not everyone is enlightened. So 
it is difficult but not impossible. There is a, a bunch of different ways to help us attain uh, more peace in the mind. So a uh, suggestion number one, there are three suggestions. Um, for many people, probably only two will really apply, but let's start with number one. Number one, create a setting free of distractions, a sacred place, a sacred space in your home. So my suggestion specifically is that this sacred space does not have to be big. It could just be a, a little corner that you clear away and set aside specifically for yourself. So this is your spiritual retreat. This is your mini vacation of the mind, a place that is free of distractions, a place where you can quiet down and just be with yourself. So it is difficult for us usually to filter out our sensory input and therefore we think about different things because we perceive different things. The idea of setting up a sacred space is to have that space where you don't have, where you have a minimum of distractions and sensory input. And what you set up there can be very intentional. So as an example, some people may decide to set up a figurine of the Buddha there because that conveys a feeling of serenity. And it's a reminder that when you are there looking at that particular symbol, it's a reminder for yourself to be serene as well. Now, it doesn't have to be the Buddha. It could be something else that is meaningful to you. If the cross has meaning and power to you, I would advise you to use that. I would advise you to use something, but I would also uh, caution you to not have too many, too many things in your sacred space. Be extremely selective what you allow in there because the idea is to, is to keep out the distractions that are constantly bombarding us 24 seven. So there is a lot more on the subject of sacred space, um, a place where you can meditate or just be alone uh, by yourself. There's a lot of, of people who have done that for themselves and they give different suggestions and different hints. If you were to do a search on sacred space, you're going to see quite a few examples. So I will start there. If you have specific questions about the sacred space, I would also be glad to delve into the concept in greater detail. Number two, very important, understand how to deal with stray thoughts. So this specifically is for people who have tried meditation but have not enjoyed a, a lot of success with meditation. Uh, having done it for years now, I find that the number one, uh, number one problem that people encounter has to do with, with this very topic here, dealing with straight thoughts. That is, you are sitting in meditation and yet there's constant chatter in your mind. So what do you do? Well, for a lot of people, they think that in a meditative state, they have to have no thoughts at all. Therefore, when straight thoughts do come in, they see, they think that they have failed at this task of thinking no thoughts. So in reality, uh, that isn't how meditation is supposed to work. So the way to meditate properly uh, is to first realize that as a human being, your mind is constantly working. You're going to notice different things, even at a subconscious level. Therefore, it may be basically an impossible task that you have set up for yourself if you wish to block out all thoughts completely, 100%, absolutely. So thoughts are going to come into your mind from time to time even in meditation, especially in the early stages. 
you'll find that when you go deeper into meditation, it will be very natural for these straight thoughts to get less and less until they're completely gone. And that's when you are in very deep. But when you're just getting into it, there is going to be a lot of straight thoughts, that's for sure. So when those straight thoughts occur to you, when they come into the mind, the idea is to not berate yourself. Don't beat yourself up for thinking straight thoughts because you are a human being. You're not a perfect machine-like you know, meditating android or something like that. So the idea is that when straight thoughts come in, notice that this is happening. So uh, I want to focus on this concept for just a moment. When, when we say notice that a straight thought has come into your mind, the way that I say that automatically is putting into context this idea that you are being an observer of yourself. So when you observe yourself, you can notice that, oh, look, a straight thought has come in. Being an observer is crucial. So in Chinese, guan. And when you notice that the, the straight thought has come in, what you have to do is to, is to, is to not do anything to it but to release it, let it be free to exit on its own. Now that it has entered into your mind, it can also go away. All you have to do is to not get in its way, that you not turn the thought over and over again. And that usually will manifest in thoughts about thoughts, like, why did I think that thought? Why did I let that straight thought come in? What does it mean? Am I thinking it because my subconscious wants to tell me something? Is it something that I should be aware of? Should I take special notice and maybe contemplate it? As, you know, when you do that, there's no end to it. It's a bottomless pit. So you're never going to find peace of mind if you pursue those directions. What you have to do is to, the very opposite, and that is, oh, look, a, a thought has come in. I'm not going to react to it. I'm not going to do anything. I will just uh, allow it, let it exit all by itself. So the mental imagery that the monks use can be very helpful here. So the monks who, are, who have attained a great deal of spiritual refinement through meditation, they will give the following very valuable advice. Consider your mind to be like a body of water, like a pond. So at any one time, the agitated mind is like a pond that has been disturbed. So there's like ripples everywhere, some splashing, there's water, you know, there's a, that water is disturbed. Just like the mind is disturbed or agitated. Now, when you calm your mind, you're not doing anything to the water. You are allowing the water time to settle down. Now, after a while, the surface of the pond is going to be perfectly flat because there are no more ripples. There's no more splashing around. Now, when a straight thought comes in, rather than thinking about how some little creature like a frog is jumping into the pond, causing ripples to occur, think of it as a reflection you can now see in the water because there is a bird that flies overhead. So the bird is passing over the pond and you can see the reflection of the bird in the, on the surface of the pond because it is so, it is so, uh, so placid, so completely still that it's like a mirror. You can see, you can see the sky quite well just by reflection then if you allow that thought to go away, like it entered your mind, then it is like the bird disappearing from sight because it continues its flight. So you see the reflection of the bird on the surface of the pond for a moment. You do nothing to the bird. You don't attempt to shoot it down. You don't yell at it. You just let it continue flying and soon, it disappears from, its reflection disappears from the surface of the pond. 
So use that mental imagery to help you. Every time there's a straight thought, simply let it go. Let it fly away is the idea. So hold on to that idea in your meditative practice. You will find that you get better and better at it until you can get to a very deep level of meditative trends when quite naturally, no straight thoughts come in at all. There is no mental chatter whatsoever. You are able to be quiet and enjoy this lovely silence without further commentary. Okay, and then there's a number three, which applies to the people who have gone through the initiation ritual called Qiu Dao. So the three treasures of the Dao are designed for applications such as this. When you are unsettled, when you are agitated, if you recall and use the three treasures, you will find that it has an immediate impact. Even when your hands are otherwise occupied, like when you are driving, you can use the first two of the three treasures and gain an instant calmness. You will be able to calm down much easier with the three treasures uh, than before. So, and for those of you who have not yet obtained the three treasures for yourself, uh, I would say, well, you know, you can always seek an opportunity to go through the, the ritual yourself and be able to use the three treasures as well. It does take practice. The more you practice, the better you get at it. Uh, and the more you will be able to attain that peace of mind uh, much more easily. Okay, so that's the, that's, uh, I hope, complete answer to the, to the second question. Uh, as usual, if anyone needs to go into details on anything, just let me know and we will delve into more details. Let's take a look at the next one. Uh, I believe this is the last question uh, that I have collected from last time. Uh, there was another question that was already answered and that was about the, uh, the difference between humble brag in social media and just, a, just, uh, just wanting to share about what's going on with your life with your loved ones. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with the latter. Uh, to avoid humble brag, uh, simply be aware of you, uh, the possibility that you may be serving your, your own ego instead of the purpose of sharing. <clears throat> And the last question from last time was about this Chinese character. And the pronunciation of this character is very easy. It's I. Uh, not really a coincidence. We were just talking about AI for a moment. But this is I. And it means love. So the question is whether or not the meaning has remained constant throughout history you know, ancient Chinese, classical Chinese, and, and modern Mandarin. And also, uh, it's a little bit, it can be, for someone who's not a native speaker, it can be difficult to tell the difference between the meaning of different characters. So there's there's I, and then there's ci. So, first of all, in ancient and modern times, the meaning of I has remained constant. And what does it mean? It's love in the most general sense, love in its various forms. So it's actually a perfect linguistic equivalent to the English word love. Wherever you use the word love, you can also use the Chinese character I. No exception. Now, that's not always the case. Last time I talked about the character being, which is sickness uh, in English, but Unlike the word sick, it doesn't have the additional connotations, like the slang connotations. We'll say something is uh, sick as being, you know, very, very cool and very impressive. Wow, that is so sick. That's, uh, that's kind of a modern usage. Okay, well, there's none of that in Chinese. And we can also say things like, I am so sick of it. I'm, I'm already, uh, I've had enough. I'm sick and tired of it. Well, well that's also, you can't use bing in that fashion. But for I, it's the exact equivalence to love 
So wherever you say love, you can also say I. So what about this other character, Ci? Well, the romanization, the pinyin romanization for this character is actually C I, C like cat, and then the letter I. So when you look at C I, you might say, okay, so uh, C, like S I. Uh, no, that's not the way it sounds. So this is a great weakness of the romanization system known as pinyin. When you have C I, it's supposed to be C. It's like T S I. So the older style, the Wei Gao system, in this case, is actually easier to lead to the right pronunciation. C. So what is the difference between C and I? So I means love, as you can see. C means compassion. Uh, but then there is also loving kindness. So let's talk about that. Si specifically is applied to loving kindness at different levels. So when I say different levels, I mean the level of parents to children. So a parent, whether father or mother, possibly even grandparents, etc., can be can have the kindness, the si, loving kindness toward the kids, toward the children, but not the other way around. So kids, the children, are not, as they're being nurtured by the parents, what they feel toward the parents is not kindness. And that makes sense in English and also makes sense in Chinese. So the nurturing kind of loving kindness can also be applied from teacher to students. It can also be applied from you to those who don't enjoy life as well as you do, for those less fortunate who perhaps uh, do not live in a country that has all the good things that you enjoy and take for granted. So you can feel compassionate toward them. So they don't necessarily feel towards you because they don't feel this nurturing, loving kindness to someone who has, in their view, all of the great things in the world. So that's what I mean when I say that it's one way. It's a nurturing kind of love. So that's the difference. It's, uh, you can think of it as a subset of I. So when you feel si towards something, maybe a pet, there's love. But when the pet looks back on, at you, let's say you have a very cute puppy dog and the puppy looks at you with love, the, the puppy dog is not feeling si, but more like admiration, you know, wow, this human being is my source of food. How cool is that? Um, so that's the difference between the two. That's what I mean by one way. And I hope that this clarifies the difference between the two. Let's go ahead and do the meeting ending ritual, everybody. Shiri. Yen Xiang Huo Tang. Sija San Jigong. Yi Jigong. Zai Jigong. San Jigong. Sija Go Go Si Jigong. Jie Ban Yi Jigong. Okay, everybody, we are done.